Hey, welcome back to the Ready State. Today we're gonna to talk about upgrading the big three. Now the big three are three movements that one of our superstar friends, Stuart McGill, talks about around just daily input for spinal health. And the way to think about these three motions are if this is your spine, what we're doing is we're gonna to try to load the spine in flexion, extension, and laterally. So the idea is, this is my spine, I'm just gonna to try to introduce some appropriate loads into this thing and try to resist those loads in a whole bunch of different planes. Very simple ideas. We love this because if we're thinking it's just kind of like uh, how does our friends uh, our friends talk about it at, at like Squat University, spinal hygiene. Like just like brushing your teeth, just a little bit of input. Now if you're in a formal movement practice like yoga or Pilates or you're lifting weights, you may not need to do these things because you're challenging your spine with all of the exercises you're doing. You're holding kettlebells, you're doing farmer's walks. But for the rest of us, or on days when we're not training, or if we're coming out of spine pain or pain around the spine, or we're trying to rebuild tolerance or desensitize, these are wonderful activities to put in. Even if you're just saying, hey, I haven't loaded today, I haven't moved today, it's kind of an off day, or I've been traveling, or something's happened, these are great exercises. Now the difference is, Instead of just doing them for reps or, or counting seconds, we're gonna upgrade them by forcing ourselves to also care about breathing volume. And we've done this with the Y balance test and some other things. When we can integrate breathing into these practices, we see we end up getting a much bigger bang for the buck, especially when we're trying to work on persistent pain or, or chronic pain or we have sort of long-term pain relationships with our spine. Integrating breathing is a fast way to really radically change the movement thinking around the brain. So the brain is saying, hey, look at you're moving differently, and breathing is the first movement. So when we can change the quality or some aspect of the movement, sometimes our brain is, is smart enough to say, oh, that's different. So those things aren't conjoined anymore. So one of the reasons we think we have good outcomes when we improve or change someone's movement pattern, and we're just lifting the needle out of this old groove where sometimes pain and movement become conjoined. It's a convenient uh, process and aspect of the brain. So here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna show you the three, the big three, and then show you how to integrate them. The first one, and you can do them in any order, maybe Stu has a, has a, a priority he likes, but the first one is just a curl up. And what we're recognizing is that we do need to put some flexion load into the spine and this is by contracting this, but supporting the back, this is an easy way to begin to reclaim some of that functional tolerance. So what we see is that people will curl up and do this curl, and then you know, moving slowly or with tempo, right? But what they're not doing is breathing. So what I'm interested in is not just breathing in and breathing out, but as I curl up, I'm gonna try to come back to my 90% reference volume of my breathing. So what is that? So if I'm laying on my back and I take the biggest breath in through my nose I can, I'm initiating through the diaphragm, I'm gonna breathe laterally into my ribs. So breath here, into my ribs into the chest, into the back, treating the breathing apparatus, the mechanics around the spine as a radial contractile field, seeing it uh, the way Philip Beach describes it, as all of this musculature expands and contracts to try to maintain the length and integrity of the spine. So what we're trying to do is flex and, and resist deflection of these spinal shapes during these big three, but simultaneously, I need you to breathe because that's where the disconnect is. I wanna be able to take these movements and have them scale into actual carrying and moving and, and, and functioning, right? Putting those things back into context. So instead of just curling up and adding this load and coming back down, instead, I'm gonna take a big breath in, breath out, and remember, I've just established what we think is a one rep max breath. So that breath I took from the belly, 360, that's my peak breath. That's the most air I can get in with no demands. And what I'm gonna try to do during these big three is see if I can chase back to that volume. And what we say is, hey, try to hit 90%. That's kind of our rough guideline. Is it 90%? It's probably less. It depends on my competency, it depends on my stiffness, it depends on the demands on the spine. But I'm trying to get back to that reference volume. So here on my back, here's no load, belly goes wild. That's peak air, right? And we can measure that. Now, what I'm looking though is that as I do this, curl up, I can still get organized beforehand. Big breath in, big breath out. Stiffen as I get out, everything's shrinking. But then as I curl up, I'm gonna to try to get back to this 
And what you're going to see is that many of us are doing these, and we don't breathe very well here. And so what we're mapping is a compensation pattern. I'm interested in some of these core endurance or trunk endurance exercises. And if it is in fact an endurance exercise, it's probably lasting longer than four to six seconds. So do your best you can, but see if you can hold this position and get back to that breathing. So that's teaching me not just to be stiff all the time, but to be able to be dynamically stiff, appropriately stiff. I'm gonna be stiff enough and trust my brain to be able to control my spine for this load and still be able to ventilate at the same time, which is the game when we're trying to do activities of daily living. So this curl up is the first one. Second one is gonna sound like, oh, I've done this before, which may just be a side bridge. Now, if you are sensitized or not feeling very, very keen on this, this already is a side bridge. I'm already loading this lateral motion into the spine. I'm trying to resist that. So what I'll try to do is push into the elbow as hard as I can, Try to get this, remember that the relationship between shoulder and trunk is another way that I create stability off the trunk. The same way I create stability through the hip and the pelvis through the trunk. And then you can of course bridge up, you can take this longer, you can go into full side plank, you can go super crazy on this, and it should not be an accident that this suddenly starts to look like Turkish getup, right? These are very much Turkish getup like ideas, and one of the reasons we use Turkish getup as a trunk exercise, control exercise, or just even the first part of it. So, from this position though, even if I'm here and just, can I hit that 90% breath? Different loads, man, so I have to be stiffer here. I better be able to pick up breathing here and into my trunk, all these other places. As soon as I start to add additional load to that, I'm trying to manage that breath hitting that 90%, and then as the demands increase, we can ultimately make this very, very difficult and trying to hit that 90%, okay? So then it hits the third one, which is bird dog, right? So we're in these, some of these basic shapes, and as I'm quadruped, it's less about trying to find some perfect idealized midline range. It's more about taking a big breath in, getting stiff on the exhale, because it's easier that way. Now, can I trust that my body will know how to find these positions? Now, if I'm in this bird dog shape, and all of a sudden I default, what you'll see is you don't really have access. So when we focus on being able to maintain the integrity of that breathing volume, you'll see that a lot of positions will automatically correct. People will get out of some shapes that are just less effective, Drop my head, easier to breathe. So one of the ways that we use breathing is for helping people find the feeling of positions that allow them to maintain the integrity of their breathing volume. The same skill then translates up to all of our other shapes. How do we know we own a position? We can breathe in that position. Thank you, Greg Cook, right? Breath is king of the brain. And what we're trying to do is tell our bodies we own this position and the reason I own this real estate is I can breathe there. So instead of just giving it, hey, make sure you can breathe, establish that one rep max volume, then chase that one rep max volume into that 90% so that any shape, any exercise, which feels like sometimes a throwaway, afterthought, accessory motion becomes very much about skill. If you're hitting that 90% or whatever that 90% is for you, and all of a sudden it starts to dissipate, starts to drop down, you've lost your ability to maintain that ventilation integrity, you're done with the rep, you're done with the set. And we're using that breath volume as a way of saying, hey, I've lost my capacity, I've lost my skill here. And as I develop skill and reintegration and movement practice, I'll be able to maintain that breath volume and that will remain constant, then I can use the clock. So, upgrade the big three, add the breath in, you'll see it will improve your spine tolerance hygiene practice. See you guys next time.